and welcome to this uh, revision video. This is for AQA uh, and in this video we're going to look at bonding. Now the whole point of this is just to uh, go through and give you an overview of um, of the, the topic of bonding for AQA and these videos are very specific to AQA as well. Um, so um, if you're studying AQA that would be great. Um, also just uh, before I start these PowerPoints that I'm going to be using on here you can purchase them uh, if you want to use them for uh, revision or um, if you want to print them out or look at them in your own time etc um, if you look in the comments box or the description box of this video you'll see the link there where you can uh, where you can get a hold of them okay so like I say these videos are uh, dedicated to AQA and they are tailored to the specification and the spec points are all on there um, so Okay, so let's have a look at the first. This is ionic bonding. Okay, so ionic bonding are basically where you've got charged ions and they're held together by these very strong electrostatic attractions. These are oppositely charged ions. Um, and basically that's all an ionic bond is. And it works in a really simple way, really. Um, so to get a full shell of electrons, in this case, we've got sodium and chlorine, as you can see here. There it is. So you've got sodium and chlorine. To get a full shell of electrons, the sodium will have to give up an electron to chlorine, so it gets a full shell. Sodium has an empty shell, or it'll have a full one underneath this shell here. Uh, and they become stable by being attracted to each other by forming an oppositely, uh, by forming an electrostatic attraction between the oppositely charged ions. So let's have a look. There's the electron, and as you can see, it jumps onto the chlorine, and we form these ions. Now notice we draw boxes around them, square boxes, and we put a plus and the negative charge around them to show that they are oppositely charged. Okay, um, These ions, obviously, depending on the group, will depend on what type of ion that you form. So if you look in group 1, group 1s all form plus 1 ions. Group 2 form 2 plus 3s, form 3 pluses. 4s very, very rarely don't. They don't really form uh, ionic bonds. They're covalent um, with each other. So we don't bother with them. Group five, right, these form three minus ions. Remember, it's easier for these to gain the three electrons than it is to get rid of five. So that's where they form three minuses. Group six form two minuses. And group seven form one minuses. Okay, you need to know a few of these molecular ions as well. So these are a little bit different. So hydroxide is OH minus. Nitrate is NO3 minus. Um, ammonium is NH4 plus. Sulfate is SO4, two minus. And carbonate is CO3. Two minus. Make sure you know these. Um, you've got to. These are so so important because you'll see them a lot in chemistry, obviously. Um, so uh, yeah, make sure you know the charges of them. Uh, there's one positive one there, which is ammonium, but most of them are negative. Okay. Uh, right. So let's have a look a little bit more at some ionic bonding. Um, and actually, what we can do is we can work out the formula uh, of an ionic compound, and we can use this method called a swap and drop method. I'm going to show you two examples here. So the first thing you have to do is write down your two ions. In this case, we're going to look at calcium ion and a nitrate ion, as you can see there. What we then do is swap the charges over. So the two now moves over to the nitrate and the minus moves over to the calcium. We then drop the charges. That includes the plus and minus bit. And we drop them so that they are in lower case, so the subscripts. Um, so that's what happens there. Notice the minus is obviously gone from calcium. Uh, and then we just simplify to the whole number. Uh, in this case, this is CaNO32, so it's calcium nitrate, and that's basically how we work them out. Let's look at a slightly different one. This is stick with calcium, and this time we're going to use oxygen. Again, swap the charges over, 2 minus and 2 plus. Drop the charges, Ca2 and O2, and then simplify. So we're left with Ca2O2, but we can simplify that to just CaO. That is calcium oxide. So you can do this at any type of uh, ion it's dead easy to do okay really quick and easy okay um ionic compounds for example sodium chloride they have giant ionic structures so they form things like this here here's an example of sodium chloride the yellow circles or spheres are sodium ions the purple ones are chloride ions you can see they pack together in a regular structure very cubic shape giant repeating pattern you've got to know um, the, the description of the structure of these things is pretty important. These things dissolve in water pretty well. Um, they, um, water is polar. It can be attract the uh, positive and negative ions. So obviously the delta negative oxygen on water is attracted to the positive sodium ions and the delta positive hydrogens are attracted to the chloride ions. And so water can break these structures up. 
They can also conduct electricity when they're molten or dissolved in solution because the ions are free to move around. When they're solid like this, they can't because the ions are not free to move around. As you can see, they're fixed in a cubic shape. Uh, and they have very high melting points because we have lots of strong electrostatic attractions. Um, and these basically require lots of energy to overcome them. Um, so um, this is why sodium chloride and other ionic compounds have such high melting points. Very important to include things like strong electrostatic forces and lots of energy is needed to overcome them. So make sure you get all these keywords in your answers when you're writing them. Okay, covenant bonding is another type of bonding, right? This is um, um, a little bit more trickier, actually, um, even though you might think it might look simple. Um, basically, covenant bonding is the sharing of outer electrons, okay? Very important. Uh, and we um, uh, basically do this very similar to ionic compounds to get a full shell of electrons, except this is sharing electrons. We're not giving up or receiving electrons. These are the sharing of them. And there is still an electrostatic attraction. There's that word again. This time, it's between the shared electrons and the positive nucleus in the middle. That's where the attraction is between these. That's what's going to hold these things together. Uh, we can get single, double, and triple bonds. Um, basically, you can see there, this is a single, that's a double, and that's triple. So we're sharing three electrons each. And um, the covalent bonds can also be represented by lines. And you might have seen these in displayed formula. Okay. Date of covalent bonds, on the other hand, are a little bit different. So um, these are also known as coordinate bonds. And this is where an atom donates two electrons or a pair of electrons to another atom. In this case, we're going to look at ammonia with a lone pair of electrons and the hydrogen ion, H+, with no electrons in. This can't form a covalent bond because it doesn't actually have any electrons to share. So if it wants to bond with another atom, both the electrons are basically going to have to come from the other atom which is a bit unfortunate. So these are called data coordinate and coordinate bonds. And if you see on here, there's the hydrogen look. It's now sharing this electron, uh, sharing the electrons with nitrogen. But both of them have come from the nitrogen to the H plus ions. Make sure you're saying where they come from, where they go to. So there it is there, uh, and it can be represented with an arrow. Um, and the arrow shows the direction of where the electrons have been donated from and where they're going to. So make sure you get the arrow the right way around. Okay. Um, the other type, giant covalents. So they were all simple molecular, very simple small ones. Giant covalents are a lot, lot bigger. Um, and these include things like graphite and diamond. So let's look at graphite first. Graphite is um, basically um, made up of um, hexagons. And uh, each carbon is bonded three times. Uh, and the fourth electron is delocalized. You can see here, Look, if you look at a carbon, one, two, three times, delocalized electrons. Um, are being delocalized. So lots of strong covalent bonds means it's got a very high melting point. Remember, it's really loads of energy to break these bonds. So that's going to take quite a bit of energy. But the layers, graphite is very unique in its structure. It's made up of layers. There's weak forces between these layers and they can slide over each other relatively easily. And then delocalized electrons allow you to conduct electricity. They can carry a charge. Very important that you say it carries a charge. They can conduct electricity, which is unusual for, um, obviously, non-metals like carbon. The layers are really far apart in comparison to a covalent bond length. Um, and so this means graphite is pretty low density uh, compared to um, other um, giant covalent structures. Okay, so it's insoluble, doesn't dissolve. Um, the bonds are far too strong. Um, you can't break them when you've added them to water. So you can, you can basically put a pencil in water and it won't dissolve, thankfully just in case you wanted to do that. Um, okay, diamond. Diamond's another one. Diamond's a bit different, though. Um, it has, each carbon is bonded four times instead of graphite, where it's three times. Um, now, because this doesn't have, um, um, because this uh, doesn't have the gap like graphite does, um, <coughs> it means that they are, um, they can conduct heat pretty well because they're really tightly packed together. Um, and diamonds, obviously, um, are formed from volcanoes, so obviously they will be able to uh, conduct um, or absorb some of this heat. Uh, so unlike graphite, diamonds can be cut to make gemstones, so you can cut them, and um, graphite can't because it's just fragile, it breaks into, into layers. Um, it's got a really high melting point, a bit like graphite, um, loads of strong covalent bonds, you need a lot of energy to overcome them. Uh, doesn't conduct electricity very well though, um, in fact, um, it doesn't conduct electricity um, at all, really. It doesn't have any free electrons. 
um, like graphite does. So um, it's non-conductive electricity. And again, just like graphite, it's insoluble. The bonds are far too strong for water to break them apart. Okay, so make sure you know these examples of giant covalence. Okay, shapes of molecules. This can be a bit tricky, this. Um, and there's a very kind of certain rule in which you can apply. You might have seen other rules as well, but I think this one's relatively straightforward to use. I hope you agree. So we're going to use the number of bond pairs and lone pairs of electrons to work out the shape of a molecule. So let's have a look at this molecule here. They have a very specific shape. Um, and this is because the bonds repel each other equally. Um, they try and get as far away from each other as possible. Remember, we've got electrons in these bonds. They're like charges, so they will repel each other. So this means they have a very specific shape. So if we have a lone pair uh, next to a bond pair, though, these repel more than two bond pairs together. And two lone pairs repel even further. So let's have a look at an example. Here's one here. This is one with a one lone pair. Now, if you look at the angle of this one, with no lone pairs of electrons and this one with a lone pair, look, the angle has decreased. This is pushing these bonds closer together because the lone pair is repelling them even further. And if we have two lone pairs like this one, the bond angle shrinks even further. Um, so you can see here. So what they're doing is they change the shape of the bond angles and lone pairs, what they do is they push them closer together uh, and generally as a rule, not all the time though, but for uh, things like tetrahedral structures, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, every time you have a lone pair, you reduce the uh, remaining bond angle by two and a half degrees. So um, but you have got to be careful for some other molecules where this doesn't happen because they cancel out. But I'll point that out later on. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these. So we're going to use the bond pair and lone pair electrons to work out the shape of a molecule. So the first thing you should do is really draw out your dot cross a compound a dot, dot cross model here basically just helps you to work out how many bond pairs and how many lone pairs you've got if you've got an ionic molecule which they sometimes give you all you do is um you add electrons to the central atom for a negative ion so um uh, this is if your molecule has a negative ion and remove them if it's a positive ion so for example ammonium and h4 plus the nitrogen would have four electrons Normally nitrogen has five, but we take one away to take into account this, so it has four. Um, this is only, of course, this is not what happens in reality. We are only using this method to work out the uh, bond angle and the shape. Okay, this is not what happens in reality. It's just a method of working it out. So, um, so yes, so let's have a look at this one. So the total in this case, if we add them all up, tells you the shape. In this case, it is a tetrahedral. We've got four bond pairs, there we are. No lone pairs left on the central carbon, so it's a total of four. Um, so if you um, have lone pairs, you need to replace the bonds for lone pairs and change the shape and the bond angle, which we'll look at in a minute because they've got special names. So something like this here. Okay, and you can see water. Obviously, this has two bond pairs, two lone pairs, um, but crucially, it's based on a tetrahedral. That's the very important thing. It isn't a tetrahedral. It's based on that, um, and all we do is reduce the bond angle by two lots of two and a half, which is five degrees. Okay, so let's look at these shapes with no lone pairs first. Okay, so you've got to know the names of these shapes and you've got to be able to know the angles of them and recognize them, etc. So we're going to use the bond pairs and lone pairs of electrons to work out the shape of a molecule. So let's look at the first one. This one's got two bond pairs and no lone pairs. Here's an example, um, which is beryllium dichloride. The name of the shape is linear. You can see it's 180 degrees here, and we have two atoms that are obviously um, joined either side. No lone pairs. Okay, let's look at another one, BF3. Bond pairs three, no lone pairs. So if you have this scenario, uh, we have three bond pairs, no lone pairs. We have a trigonal planar. This is a flat molecule, 120 degrees either side. Okay. Uh, four bond pairs and no lone pairs. These molecules are called tetrahedrals. This is the first time when we actually have a 3D shape. Um, and so here's an example of a tetrahedral. We have one bond, one atom coming towards you, one in your plane of vision, that one's in your plane of vision, and that one's going away from you. Uh, the bond angle is 109.5 for all tetrahedrals. Okay, if you have five bond pairs, and again, all of these have got no lone pairs, the shape we are looking at is trigonal bipyramidal. So you can see, obviously, this is an example of PCL5, but here's an example here. So you can see we've got three here. There's the three. So we've got one, two, three, okay, in the plane. And then we have two top and bottom as an axis. So this bit is planar, 
and it's triangular shape, so we call it trigonal planar. But this is trigonal bipyramidal. Um, so it's basically, if you look at the trigonal planar one here, that's basically that, but just tipped up on its side, you can see. But it's bipyramidal because actually, if we draw a line going from there to there, there to there, and there to there, we form a pyramid on the top, and we form a pyramid on the bottom as well. So that's why we call it trigonal bipyramidal. Bond angles, 120, because that's basically just that tipped on its side. But the bond angle between the top, the polar ones here, and the um, trigonal planar bit in the middle is 90 degrees. This one's got two angles, so make sure you know the difference. Okay, final one um, is one with six bond pairs and no lone pairs. Um, this is an example of an octahedral structure. It's very similar to trigonal bipyramidal, except in the middle, as you can see here, we have a square shape. You can see the square shape here, okay, in the middle. Two axes, top and bottom. The bond angle here is 90 degrees. We call it octahedral. Okay, so let's look at them now with um, with lone pairs. So there's not as many of these, um, but we're basing them, remember, on the original shape. So we're going to use the bond pairs and lone pairs again to work this out. So here's an example. This one's got three bond pairs, one lone pair. So this is an example of pyramidal. An example is ammonia. There we go. Looks a little bit like tetrahedral, so we've got the lone pair there. If we go for the two bond pairs and two lone pairs, we get a bent molecule or non-linear, it's also known as. So we've got the lone pairs there on the side. Again, look, we've shrunk the bond angle from 107 to 104.5. So that's been shrunk by two and a half degrees. Okay. Three bond pairs and two lone pairs. An example is CLF3, trigonal planar. Now, this one's 120. Again, we've taken the bonds from the top and the bottom, and we get this flat trigonal planar structure. Two lone pairs. Notice the bond angle here is still the same as what it was before. These lone pairs are repelling each other equally. This one repels these bonds down. This one repels them back up again, so they cancel out. And this is exactly the same for um, this one with four bond pairs and two lone pairs, based on an octahedral. Um, you can see here the bond angle is 90 degrees. Lone pairs are pushing equally, um, and so that's quite important. So the bond angle actually remains unchanged. The two lone pairs repel equally from opposite sides. Make sure you know the names of these shapes. Okay, electronegativity. So, we need to remember this definition. Electronegativity is the ability for an atom to attract electrons towards itself in a covalent bond. And basically, the further up and right you go in this, um, in this here, this periodic table, the more electronegative the element is. This is excluding the noble gases. This is why we've blacked them out. So, fluorine is the most electronegative element. Um, we can use the something called the Pauling scale, which helps us to quantify how electronegative something is. There's fluorine. Look, fluorine is the most electronegative, so four will be the biggest number here. Um, but as we go further away, the electronegativity drops. Basically, the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond is. So just watch out for this scale in your exam. Okay, so let's have a look at polar bonds. So covalent bonds can become polar. The atoms attached to it have a difference in electronegativity. So the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more polar it will be. So looking at this example, here we've got H and Cl bonded together. The chlorine is the most electronegative, so it's pulling the electrons towards the chlorine more than the hydrogen. We give it this little delta negative symbol to show, to show that it's pulling the electrons towards it. Hydrogen's got the delta positive. Okay. Here's another molecule. This atom is basically, uh, or this molecule, sorry, is a molecule of chlorine. They're both just as electronegative as each other. So for that reason, this is not polar because the electrons sit bang in the middle of the bond. Um, so these things are not polar. Hydrocarbons are the same. They're classed as non-polar as well. So like alkanes, etc., and alkenes. So these things, um, the electrons are just shared equally within that bond. Sometimes uneven distributions, well they do, actually uneven distributions of charge leads to polar molecules. So water is a classic sign of that. See the electrons, they're now distributed unevenly. They're not spread across. The charge isn't spread equally across the molecule. So water is an example of an uneven distribution. However, if you look at ones where we've got a bit of symmetry, like here, this is a completely symmetrical molecule. Um, so this one, uh, are actually non-polar. Even though they've got polar bonds, the electrons have been pushed either side equally. So we call this a symmetrical molecule. And so these actually have no overall polarity. So you've got to be really careful for that and watch out for that. Okay, intermolecular forces. These are really, really important. Okay, the first one are van der Waals, also known as induced dipole, dipole. These exist between 
atoms and molecules. So we're not talking about bonds here. We're talking about weak forces between molecules. Uh, and you need to know these fit into like a little kind of league table of other intermolecular forces. And Van der Waals are the weakest uh, out of all of them. And they exist in any molecule that basically has electrons in them. Um, so basically, a Van der Waals is where a dipole can be created when they move near another atom or molecule. So let's have a look at this example here. So you can see that we've got an atom here. Um, and the electrons in this molecule are not normally unevenly distributed, but when they move near another molecule, they are. And you can see the electrons are being moved over to one side of the molecule, and we get this delta negative and delta positive on there. This dipole, though, is only temporary. It's only there when it's next to another molecule that's nearby, and obviously that molecule will have electrons as well. And basically, when they move away, the interaction is destroyed. So you can see here, when this molecule is near another molecule, we have a delta negative and a delta positive. As soon as this molecule leaves, the electrons will shuffle back onto the other side and even itself back out again. But for the time that they're close by, there is this weak interaction, delta negative, delta positive. That's why we call them induced dipole-dipoles. It's only brought about when it's near another molecule. Okay, We get this force of attraction. Um, okay, so... Let's see if we can apply this to something specifically. So, for example, iodine. Iodine is a classic example. Van der Waals forces can hold some of these molecules and crystal structures. So, iodine has this type of crystal structure. It's pretty pretty. Um, it's a um, it's solid at room temperature. Iodine, and the key thing is we have weak Van der Waals forces holds the iodine molecules together. Remember, it's I two, but we have strong covenant bonds that hold the two iodine atoms together. Don't get these two confused. Okay, the bigger the molecule, the atom, the more Van der Waals forces you have. So that's what you're looking out for because they have larger electron clouds. So when we boil a liquid, and um, it could be water, for example, we're breaking the weak Van der Waals forces and not the covenant bonds. Actually, water has hydrogen bonding as well, so we try to break them. But when we boil a liquid, um, that's what happens. So, for example, bromine. We're just breaking these weak forces, not the bonds. So never mention the bonds when we're talking about these small molecules. We've got to have enough energy to overcome these forces. Um, hydrocarbons, remember, we said were, um, uh, don't have this polarity, so they have van der Waals. And basically, the longer straight-chain hydrocarbons have more van der Waals than uh, forces, than energy, uh, than your kind of non-straight or branched chain and shorter ones. So basically, these need more energy is needed to overcome these forces. And this increases the uh, the boiling point of these molecules. And like I say, the branched ones, these are uh, hydrocarbons with bits sticking out of them. They can't pack together as much. So this means that the van der Waals force is a lot weaker. Um, and the, um, uh, the chain, if the chain is shorter as well, this lowers the boiling point as well. So shorter hydrocarbons or hydrocarbons with a lot of branching have lower boiling points. Okay, right, let's look at the next intermolecular force. These are called dipole, dipole. They're a little bit stronger than a van der Waals. These exist when you have a molecule that has a permanent dipole. So basically the dipole exists irrespective of whether they're near another molecule or not. So things like where you have a polarity. So permanent dipoles, you're looking for polarity. Uh, HCl is an example of a permanent dipole and you have this weak electrostatic force between a delta negative chlorine, the electronegative element, and a delta positive hydrogen atom in this case. Um, so the delta negative is attracted to the delta positive as we say. So in like van der Waals forces, dipole-dipole interactions involves molecules with a permanent dipole. They are stronger than van der Waals. It is important to note, though, that even though this does have, this molecule in particular has a permanent dipole, it also has van der Waals as well. The strongest intermolecular force is the permanent dipole-dipole. Um, and we can kind of prove this as well. We can prove that polar molecules like water exist. Um, if we take a charged rod uh, and we put it near a steady stream of a polar liquid, you can do this in a burette, uh, water is an example of a polar liquid, um, then what will happen is you should see the liquid bend towards the rod um, because obviously the charge difference here. Um, and basically the molecule will align will align itself to the oppositely charged rod. So you can see here this is the positively charged rod in this example. So the delta negative oxygen will be attracted towards that positively charged rod. So it's a very important little test for polar molecules. Okay, uh, And the last intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. This is the strongest of the lot. 
Now, hydrogen bonding is quite unique. It's, a, it's basically a type of dipole-dipole force. Um, you basically get hydrogen bonding when you use very electronegative elements. So your most electronegative elements are nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. It's these three and hydrogen. So any molecules that contain nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and a hydrogen will get involved with hydrogen bonding. And it's basically the lone pair of electrons on these atoms that get involved. So that plays a very important role. So here's an example of showing hydrogen bonding. We've got all our partial charges on there. So our delta negatives, delta positives. There's the lone pair on the oxygen. The interaction is between the lone pair on the electronegative element and the hydrogen. Um, this is a hydrogen bond. Very common for them to ask this in the exam, so make sure you know how to do it. And again, just like with the previous one, molecules that have hydrogen bonding also have van der Waals and they have dipole-dipole. They have all three. It's just the strongest one is hydrogen bonding. So make sure you're very vigilant in the exam and you watch out for them. Um, so let's have a look a little bit further. Ice obviously is uh, just frozen water and it forms this very regular structure held together by hydrogen bonds but ice is strange because when you cool normally when you cool things down they get smaller they contract but ice actually expands it gets bigger and the reason why is because we have hydrogen bonding that's pushing the molecules further apart and um, this makes ice less dense so you put an ice cube in water and it floats um, let's look at the bonding points and properties of these things as well. So if you look at HF, HF has a higher bonding point than HCl. Remember HF is one of the molecules that can hydrogen bond between other molecules. Because hydrogen bonding is stronger, it needs more energy to overcome these forces. Looking at the other ones, things like HCl, HCl can't hydrogen bond. It drops massively, less energy is needed to break these. However, it starts to pick up again when we go for things like HBr and HI, and this is because, um, yes, they have dipole-dipole forces, all of these do, but the biggest effect have the biggest effect that's having an effect on the boiling point is basically the van der Waals is increasing, the atoms getting bigger, the molecules getting bigger, there's more electrons, van der Waals forces increases, so therefore the uh, boiling point increases from HCl to HI. Okay, metallic bonding. So metallic bonding, um, these are obviously giant metallic lattice structures. So these are quite large structures. They have a very unique setup. You have positive metal lines, which are the green circles there. They've formed uh, when metals donate electrons into the sea of delocalized electrons. And there's basically an electrostatic attraction between the positive metal lines and then delocalized electrons. And basically the more electrons an atom can donate, the higher the melting point. Um, so for example, magnesium has a higher melting point than sodium. Uh, it can donate two electrons into the um, delocalized cloud, where sodium can only donate one. So therefore, the forces of attraction between the positive and negative charges are a lot weaker. Metals are good thermal conductors, as you'd expect. Uh, they have delocalized electrons, and so they can transfer this kinetic energy very easily. Remember, when you heat things, the, the particles move and electrons move. It's the electrons that uh, allow the conduction of heat. They're also good electrical conductors because they can carry a charge or current. They can move that through the lattice. They have free electrons, delocalized electrons. Okay. They have high melting points. Again, strong electrostatic attractions between the delocalized electrons and the positive metal ions. Uh, and solid metals are insoluble. Um, the metallic bond is far too strong to break. Um, thankfully, um, otherwise you'll get metal structures dissolving when it rains. So that's pretty useful. Okay, let's look quickly at this particle model. Uh, pretty straightforward, this bit really. Um, solids, tightly packed, regular arrangement, really high density. You can see the arrangement of these here. They vibrate on the spot and they can't be compressed. Liquids, they are tightly packed. Again, they don't have many gaps between them. Random arrangement, high density. They move around freely and they slide over each other. Um, they're really difficult to compress because they're tightly packed. Um, the particles have a little bit more energy in them, in liquids, than you do in solids, and that's why they're moving randomly. Gases, uh, well, they're very spaced out, random arrangement, and um, very low density. Particles able to move around freely, um, and they have a lot more energy than liquids and, and solids, obviously, because they're moving around freely. So as long as you can really comment on them, that's, that's the main thing. And finally, just summarizing the bond types, um, make sure you can summarize these all, really. It's a good way of just making sure that you know all these things. Giant covalent, 
uh, graphite diamond silicon dioxide for example um, normal temperature they're solids they don't conduct uh, apart from graphite they don't conduct electricity as a liquid it's very really difficult they're normally sublime anyway they don't really melt soluble in water high melting points because you need lots of energy to break them simple moleculars these are uh, covalents as well liquids or gases normally won't conduct electricity and um, they might be soluble depending on the polarity the low breaking uh, low melting and boiling points um, because you're breaking weak forces giant ionic much much higher melting points um, generally soluble in water because they're polar they will conduct if they're dissolved in water or molten um, normally they're solids very high melting points strong electrostatic forces and metallic is pretty much the same except they will conduct a solid and liquid conduct electricity um, which is unusual unlike the rest of them um, and their usual temperature normal state is solid again high melting points because they have um, strong electrostatic forces um, so the polarity you've got to be watch out for this polarity so polar molecules they do dissolve well in polar solvents like water uh, but non-polar molecules don't hydrocarbons you need non-polar solvents really for them to dissolve so there we go that is the end of the uh, of the video i thought i, was, I hope that was a uh, useful summary of bonding there's quite a bit there bond angles are pretty important and um, just again if you uh, want a copy of this uh, of this PowerPoint be good for revision uh, just look in the um, the uh, description box for this video and click on the link there and you can get a hold of them there that's it bye bye